Welcome to the Safer at Home worship service from First Presbyterian Church, Altadena. We're glad you could be with us. We're going to be continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 of Matthew, and Jesus' teachings concerning Old Testament laws, and he's really teaching his disciples how they're supposed to live under his king, in his kingdom, and become his disciples and become like him. And so we'll be finishing up chapter 5 today. If you join me in an opening prayer, followed by lighting of the Christ candle. Our Father in heaven, help us this day to open our hearts to the transformation needed for us to become like you and your son Jesus. And as we come to you, Truly work that miracle in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I'm going to light the Christ candle. Christ candle uh, symbolizes Jesus Christ as the light of the world. The Word of God is a light unto our path and God's continual presence with His people. Now the worship team will lead us in some music.
Cody from the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we're going to talk about the last part of Matthew chapter 5, which you've just heard, uh, which is about loving our enemies, that Jesus' disciples are called to love their enemies. And uh, it's not an easy subject. It's easy to say, it's not that easy to do. Maybe it's impossible to do without God's grace. But anyway, today we're looking at the conclusion of the section of the Sermon on the Mount that contains Jesus' teaching on Old Testament laws. All of these teachings began with, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And Jesus is the fulfiller of the law and has the last word on it. And he's giving us a broader, deeper understanding of God's intention in the law. And he's updating it and saying, this is what is really required for my disciples, those who follow me. And in God's kingdom, these are, the, these are the ways these laws should be applied. He's been telling us how we are to live as people under God's rule, His kingdom. And we are to be so transformed by our relationship to Him and His Father that our righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, as it says in 5.20, it says, unless your righteousness surpasses uh, those who claim to be following God's laws, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And those were people who were very strict. And so it's not about strictness, apparently. It's about something more. And I think that that's what he's been telling us in the, the, the last... Uh, few verses of, in his reinterpretation, uh, explanation of God's requirements for Jesus, for the disciples. This means a change of heart and an infusion of love that makes us behave like Jesus behaved. Jesus loved his enemies. He was never disrespectful to his enemies. Sometimes he was blunt with his enemies. But even on the cross, he prayed for his enemies. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And so we're to be like Jesus, and we're to love our enemies. It means a, a change of heart and an infusion of love that makes us behave like Jesus. So we have to have a miracle in our hearts, I think, in, either, in order for us to do this. Uh, today's passage, Jesus continues on in the flavor of last week's passage. Or not last week, the last time I spoke, two weeks ago. Which told us that Jesus' people will not seek revenge or repay evil for evil, but be creative in dealing with people who treat us badly. And he's actually, in, the, in that last passage, eye for an eye passage, and uh, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile, he's actually dealing with the individual's response to people who misuse them or insult them. So he's, he's actually being very practical and he's teaching us how to deal with people that are difficult and people that are unreasonable, people who take advantage of us. 
So, but it's basically, basically, everyday things that a person might face, the people around you, as an individual. It's more individualistic. Today, when he talks about love of enemies, it's more of a corporate thing. The, 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 um, the verb is different, where it says, he says, you folks, you guys. Where he, where he says, I, but I, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, and that's plural, I tell you guys. The culture of Jesus' disciples is to be radically loving. More radical than any teacher has ever taught. To love your enemies. And the culture of the church, the culture of God's disciples, Jesus' disciples, is supposed to be a culture of people who are radically loving to the point of loving their enemies. I'll, I'll break it down a little bit as we go along. In today's passage, Jesus continues in the flavor of last week's passage, but uh, he takes it a step further. And he says that his people will act in a loving way and actually pray for the people who don't like us. So this is more than just uh, dealing with individual problems that come up the, in our daily lives. It's dealing with our entire approach to the world and the culture of the church. The culture of Jesus' disciples who are becoming like their rabbi. Disciples become like their teacher. Now, the Old Testament law that Jesus is referring to here is Leviticus 19.18, which says to love your neighbor as yourself. And it seems to command the duty to love those of the Israelite religious community. And in the common thought of Jesus' day, did not require Jews to love those outside their community. And this whole issue was, was dealt with in the, the parable of the Good Samaritan in, in Luke which deals with that work, uh, be, being loving your neighbor meant being, being a good neighbor. And be, loving your neighbor was extended beyond the, the Jewish community. Now, the Christian church, Jesus' disciples, are called to love the people outside their community. And to love those who are different, to love those who disagree with us. And so, this is, he's taking it further. He, he's building on what he, what he said the last time uh, about turning the other cheek, that we're actually supposed to have a positive love for our enemies. When, when Jesus' people in Jesus' day thought you, that you're supposed to love your, your fellow Israelites, but you really didn't have to love people outside the community. You didn't have to love the Romans. Uh, you didn't have to love people who were not Jewish, the Jewish religious faith. You had to be hospitable. There were certain things that you were expected to, to you know, treat people this decently, there's verses about that. But you weren't really called to the degree of love, like to love your neighbor as yourself, that didn't apply to those outside the Jewish community. But Jesus won't have any of that. He says, that's not gonna work with me. That won't do. That his followers are the kind of people whose love and respect embraces everyone, that our love and respect embraces everyone, including the people who hate us, including the people that we strongly disagree with, who strongly disagree with us. For 
those who are not part of our religious community, and even those who don't like us or think like us. And the Good Samaritan story is the main, the wonderful story that, that reveals what Jesus thinks about it. So, some things about this. He says, Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Everybody likes their own group. Everybody loves their own group to some extent. He says, be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Okay. Anyway, so, he says, if you love your enemies and you pray for those who persecute you, your enemies. You'll be like your children of the Father in heaven. You'll be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He says, God, look at God. He sends everybody the sunshine. He sends the rain on the crops. He, he provides for the world and people in the world equally. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to love this person and not love this person. God is benevolent. God has a generous heart. And he says, if you have this type of love, that you'll even love your enemies and pray for them. You'll be so close to God. You'll be so close to God. You'll be so close to God. He's going to say, you're part of my family. You're just like me. You bear my resemblance. We have an opportunity to be like Jesus. Now, you know, he's not talking about some sort of a super spiritual elite group of Christians. That's not the point. No way. No way. You can't, you can't go there. He's talking to all of us. He's talking to all of us. We're not allowed to dislike, hate, barely stand the people who, who disagree with us politically. We're not allowed to. If you're a Republican Christian, you're not going to be allowed to hate the Democrats. If you're a Democrat Christian, you're not allowed to dislike, speak evil of, mistreat, disassociate with your Republican brothers. Huh? Really? Conservative Christians, evangelicals, are not allowed. They're not allowed to dislike their liberal Christian brothers. We're not allowed to dislike the cults. We're not allowed to hate the Muslims. We're not even allowed to hate the radical Muslims that are trying to kill us. Jesus' followers are not supposed to. No siree. We're not supposed to hate anybody. Now, there's a, there's a word that's commonly used nowadays called unconditional love. And every time the, the, that I hear it, I kind of cringe. Because I think when most people say unconditional love, they're talking about being so tolerant of everything that we don't, we don't disapprove of anybody. We don't disapprove of uh, what our kids do, and it's just patently false. 
You can love somebody and still not approve of what they do. We can disapprove of the fact that the radical Muslims are trying to kill us. But that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to pray for them. You might not like President Trump, but you better pray for him. You better pray for him. Because the Bible says pray for your those in leadership. Better pray for both candidates. We better pray, thy will be done. That whatever comes out of it, the, the election that we're in right now, thy will be done. You know, there's a, uh, a common phrase that uh, two Jews met each other back in Jesus' day, they would say, peace be with you, shalom, peace be with you. I don't know what the modern day equivalent would be, God bless you maybe, have a nice day, <laughs> I don't know, but we are to, meant to be loving toward everyone, and it doesn't mean we approve of them. It doesn't mean we agree with them. You know, some of my very best friends are diametrically opposed to me as far as my political beliefs. And I'm called specifically to love them even more so. Now, you might say to me, well, Maybe that just means that I'm not supposed to hate them, but I don't have to like them. I don't have to really like them. Maybe I can love them without liking them. Well, that's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. You know, what if you said to God, God loves you, but he doesn't like you? Isn't that kind of weird? You know, love is more than just tolerating. Love is actually a positive desire for that person to be benefited and things to go well with that person and yes I'll pray that God changes the people who want to kill me so that they won't want to kill me that's okay to pray for protection on uh, other people to pray that there be peace in the world But it, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a thing of, you know, I'm not really, I, I'm not really, uh, I don't like the idea that God loves me, but he doesn't like me. And if we're called to be like him, I don't think we should just love people and not like them. Liking them means that we actually, is, is actually liking is maybe not quite right either, but it's, it's, actually working for the positive benefit of the people we disagree with and we don't like and praying and most of the time that's all we can do that's most of the time that's all we can do is pray for those who persecute us or pray for the people who don't like us and and it's whenever there's a us and them Whenever there, there's a, we're, we're the, the, the righteous ones and we're, they're the, the wrong, the evil ones. Whenever there, when there's that kind of di dynamic, we need to be praying for that other group. Now, I don't think that I should say too much more. I might have already said too much. I might have offended half of you just by bringing up politics. Some people say uh, preachers aren't supposed to talk about politics. But the reason why I don't think I should say too much is I don't want to soften the impact of Jesus' words. And I'm not good enough about doing this myself that I can tell you exactly how to do it. I think that you all need to 
go to God, listen to Jesus' words, and take them seriously, and say, how can I do this? Change my heart, make me like you, make me so loving that I can pray for my enemies. You know, the first beatitude at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, it starts way down here. Poor in spirit, oh Lord, what can I do? Now he says, love your enemies. Be complete, be like God. And, and so he goes all the way down from here to here, and this is like the punctuation mark on everything that we've talked to up to this point. This is the crescendo. This is the last part where Jesus is talking about the Old Testament laws and how that applies uh, in terms of his disciples. And his punctuation mark is, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Be like God, loves everybody the same. Have this completeness. Have this intimacy with God. And the carrot that's dangled in front of our mouth is the opportunity to be part of the family of God and to be intimate with the God of the universe. And He calls us His sons. Because we're willing to be like Him in the world. And we're willing to pray for those that we disagree with at the very least, but even the people who would kill us if they had a chance need to pray for them. Now, one of the problems with this passage is it says, be perfect for your Heavenly Father is perfect. The word perfect in English doesn't mean the same thing as what he's saying here. It's a it's a it's a it's a, a word that means something like spiritual maturity, of being so spiritually one with God and in tune with God that you're loving in all that you do and and toward the whole world. And it's not primarily a spiritual. Uh, it's not particular. It's not primarily an individual response to God. It's talking about the culture of the church. The decisions that we make and the way that we are in the world, that we're light, that we're salt, that we're peacemakers, all of the things that he said up to this point, that we're persecuted for righteousness sake or that we're willing to be So, it's something like wholehearted love for God, wholehearted, it's like being all in. That's a common thing, I'm all in. A friend of mine just signed up for one of my class, uh, one of my Zoom classes, and I got a message, I'm all in. We're all in with God, that's the perfect he's talking about. A completeness of God. And he's not talking about super spiritual. That's the thing. He's telling all of us. And it's not, I'm more spiritual than you because I'm more dedicated than you. It's not that. He says we're all supposed to be like this. Our culture is supposed to be like this. God's people are supposed to be indiscriminately loving of the world, not, a, not approving of everything, not agreeing with everything, but praying for those people that we disagree with. It's the, what Jesus is probably thinking, Similar, a similar thought in Leviticus 11, 44 and 45, and I think he repeats it more than once, he says, when God speaks to his people, and he says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You shall be holy, for I am holy. You're supposed to be like me. 
God says, I'm this way, you're supposed to be this way. Now, I've told you some of the things that I think it means. But I'm a flawed human being. I'm not Jesus. I might not have got it just right. I, I, like I said, I may have already said too much. But what I want us to do as a church, as people who are listening to me right now, is to take Jesus seriously. The only way we're ever going to do this is to be transformed in our hearts by Jesus' presence. We have a living Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is with me, whatever men may say. We don't have a dead Savior. We have a living Savior. His Holy Spirit lives in us. God's Spirit lives in us. But the only way we're ever even going to come close to any of this is if God changes our hearts. We need, we need to have our hearts transformed so that we can be like Jesus. Not super spiritual, not holier than thou, not claiming to be right. I, I've known a few people that thought they were had reached sinless perfection. And they were pretty hard to deal with. He doesn't want us to be like that. Because when you become like this, when you start dealing with what Jesus says here, what happens? Ah, oh, you're poor in spirit again. Ah, oh, I'm back at step one. I'm back at the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh God, I can't do it. No, you can't. But you can be transformed and you can become like Jesus progressively, I think. I don't think it's, I don't believe, I don't believe in uh, that we ever arrive with God. I think we're always in a process. But this, Jesus tells us really clearly what his community is supposed to be like. supposed to be like him. What can I say? What can I say? You know, you're not supposed to be like what Pete thinks it should be. We're supposed to be like what he thinks it should be. Let's, let's pray together, if you join me now, uh, in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we uh, need to remind you to send your tithes and offerings. Uh, we're still hanging in here at the church, trying to keep things going. And, uh, the good, good news is that we have an interim pastor that's coming within a couple weeks. And uh, you'll be blessed to hearing from her. And uh, if you'll just uh, receive the benediction now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send us all out with your benediction. Lord, Change our hearts, make us like Jesus as we leave, as we live our days. I pray that you would not allow us to settle for anything less than being your disciples. 
We pray for your transforming power to work mightily in us through the Holy Spirit. That your love would be poured out in our hearts through Jesus Christ. And that that love would pour out into the world. That people would see the Father's glory. That they would see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.